when you sign up as an artist, you don't always get the the long form agreement. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's no, like, you don't. No, not at all. <laughs> there's a lot of the, yo. There's peaks and troughs, and those troughs, whether it's you know personal or just. I mean, there must be a level of PTSD from coming off a tour like, um, like yes. uh, 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 a, a funk dubious house of pain cypress. You know, there is, isn't there? Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's... Talk to me about that. Talk to me about the, the, the levels in which you, you know, respectfully, you you go through these things, and a lot of artists would, may not ever have experienced it. Well, the killer killer podcast. KillerKellerOfficial.com You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Yo, Nolan Poland Records for underground classics. NolanPolandRecords.com Beatbox Creative to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Gala Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Gala Podcast, live and direct, central London, or as central as you need to be, dare to be, could be, should be, want to be. You don't want to be anywhere else a sport and art, I tell you. Big shout out to NoelPolandRecords.com. Hold tight. GraffitiKings.co.uk and all people with a strange station.co.uk holding it down. Oh, I'm rushing this because I am gushing in this. This is one of my... Fanboys going up to 20 right now and on a Richter scale, we're going transatlantic to somebody that without question he he helped show. in fact let me let me just dial back a second. He was trying to figure out Zoom and every so often he'd pull up his finger as if like he's in the middle of a routine. And I was like, yo, DMC champion, executioners. Um, common DJ, tour DJ. We're, we're talking about legacy, legacy, legacy uh, uh, life. Mr. Sinister inside the place. Oh, Ty, how are you? I'm blessed, man. How are you, man? I'm grateful. I'm blessed. I'm uh, just uh, appreciative that people are still uh, loving me, man, and that, 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 I, that my music is still making an impact, man. I'm just blessed and I'm grateful. People, you know, they, 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 they see you as a mentor, man. They genuinely... Hats off, my brother. Hats. Thank you very much, man. Thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate that so much, man. I never even looked at myself as a mentor, but I really appreciate that, man. Really. <laughs> and life is good. Life is good for you at the moment. Let's talk Let's yes. talk about the here and now. Yes, right now, um, everything's great. Um, um, right now, I'm not in New York. I'm actually with, a, with, with one of my friends in Boston. So I got, like, time to, like, be out of New York. Because sometimes New York can get really hectic and... I've been in Boston right now for at least six days, and I've just had so much of a clear head, uh, uh, despite all the noise and stuff. It's like really quiet out here, so I've been able to like really get a lot of creative things done. Like as far as uh, my album, I'm working on an album. I've been able to sit down and actually record and actually just concentrate, like get the time here that I really don't have in New York. And I'm just living like life is great right now. You know, I'm relaxed. I'm uh, I'm doing more of the family thing. I'm laid back trying to deliver a good album, just being really peaceful, man. And um, it's, 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 it's good for me. It's working out. And um, mm. I just feel great. I feel good. Live a good album. That's an interesting way of putting it. Because when you are creating, no matter what it is within the time frame of the creative patterns in which you're working within, whether it's turntablism or, you know, production, it is a life, isn't it? That you're trying to um, encapsulate. Yeah, you're, you're trying to encapsulate in one project product yes yes so it's kind of like the creative the creative side for me is really great it helps me to like just really uh keep my mind at ease and i've been able to do a lot of stuff man i actually have a, a nice album coming i've been able to do a lot of things right now and, and i'm just creating and moving and ideas have been coming so much and i've been taking advantage of the fact that they're coming because as everybody knows like as artists sometimes we usually go through blocks um, mm. anybody, MCs, DJs, we all go through the mental blocks where we feel like, wow, I'm not coming up with anything. I'm not creative. But when that moment comes and you're able to grab it, mm. just grab it, just take all the ideas and try to just go with them and run with them. That's what I've been doing. The ideas have just been coming to me now. It's like my brain cells are lit and these things are just coming to me out of nowhere. And I'm taking advantage of all that stuff. And 
being peaceful at the same time. It's just, it's a beautiful feeling, you know? Being peaceful at the same time, for sure. Um, there's been a little bit of, uh, there's been a, um, a spike in your social media recently. And now, when this goes out, I'm sure this will, this incline will continue, right? Well, at least I hope it will. I've seen in the last maybe, best part of like maybe four or five days, a, 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 a surgence of just you following creative pursuits also a lot of media now you know you've, you've done a couple of other podcasts and live sessions and yes. and then suddenly seeing you on the turntables i mean it's a joy bro it's a fucking joy it's almost like yeah. something's got a hold of you the duppy's got a hold of you <laughs> <laughs> thank you yes um well like i said i i i've um i sometimes like, i go through little blocks and i'm cool but like just being out here um i'm actually out here with a good friend of mine um She's also a DJ. Her name is Sapphire. And she's, I, I, I'm out here with her. And coming out here, it's, it's like kind of like, for a minute, I was kind of like getting really like exhausted with uh, even doing anything. Like it's just so much stuff was coming in. And I'm like, ah, oh, man, I just really just am like really lazy and creating. But like meeting her and coming out here and seeing her do her thing, it kind of like brought me back to life. Like just watching her. And, you know, for any artist out there, it's always good to see somebody that's doing the same thing you're doing and just being really productive with it and, and moving around. And, and she just like, like I saw her and I'm like, wow, it just like sparked something back in me. And I just started to go, look, I I, I got to get back into this because I normally have a, a heavy passion for this. And it, it kind of like just re-sparked my passion. And mm-hmm. recently when I got here, I just started being like, look, anything that I have, I'm just going to start just going and just moving and going and doing everything that I have in my power to do everything and, and to get my ideas out. And that's what's been happening. I think that's what you've been seeing. You've been seeing like a resurgence of a spark in me yeah. that is coming back, that all of us artists get. And it's, it's a beautiful feeling because it's like it's like a, a surge to your body. And it's like, wow, I got mm. so many ideas. I just feel alive again. I just feel like I got so much more to give right now. And it's a great feeling. Yeah, I feel you. I feel you. I, I would go as far as to say is we probably wouldn't be here having a chat if it wasn't for that spark. Um, <laughs> for real, like um, I reached out to you a little while ago, and understandably, if you were in that in that zone, I mean, I've been there with beatboxing, you know. Yes, it's, yes. It's kind of a lovely <laughs> relationship that we hold, you know. <laughs> part of a course, isn't it? Yes, 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 yes. So you're in oh. a good place, and life is life is breeding new uh, new creative energies, which is fucking yes, great. yes. Best way to describe it, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, do you ever class yourself? I mean, to me, I can only go as far as back. Now, 1997 was a really important year for me. Mm. I f- established myself within beatboxing and, you know, everything was all record stores, you know. Oh, London, yeah. London <laughs> and Soho. I remember you had a stint. I think it might have been with Common. At Jazz Cafe. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. And you yes. came to Deal Real Records, and I've got photos of this shit, bro. Like, there's me with my scully cap, just like completely like jaw dropped at you. And I was in front of you, bro. You're just bam, 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 with your tongue out, doing the whole thing. You know what I mean? I could see, I could see the, I could see the cue marks of SWAT going round. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I want to see the cue marks of swap before we go. I want to see the <laughs> just so that I remember them as, a, as I saw them. But yo, it was so informative, and um, I think for its time, um, it really cemented you within the higher echelon of DJ turntablism. Um, mm-hmm. I'd like to get into a little bit earlier before that, and how this how this came about. How how sinister got to that point? If we could reverse engineer that slightly. Oh yeah, we can reverse. I can I can bring you all the way back. Dope. Well, my father actually was a DJ back in the days, and this is early in my my ages when I was like seven. So my father, he actually was also a club DJ. He DJ the spots like Dance Interior <laughs> and all these spots in New York. And he used to come home and he had his turntables, and I used to always get up on his chair that he used to put me on, and he used to always have me like going like this and he used to always put my hands there but at that time there was no mixing I mean there was mm-hmm. no cutting and scratching so he was always making me move the fader and I would move it and then it got to the point to where I just tried to get up there myself mm-hmm. and I would turn everything on and it would come on blast and he'd be like alright well now I gotta start taking the needles and stuff out <laughs> so I have a very vast uh, uh, early career my mom's in the music and I just this is something I wanted to do 
And I started listening to all the old school radio stations. Back then it was WHBI. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the underground station. It was such a beautiful time. There was Kiss FM. There was BLS. It was Chuck Chill Out. There was Marley Mall. Uh, there was Red Alert. And I was listening to all that stuff, man, and all of it. And, you know, it got to the point where I just started practicing. Then I got into my house stage of music where I was uh, DJing house music for a little bit. Mm. And I went back to my my uh, hip hop roots and just started DJing. And hold on a second. So so when was when was this house moment where you were spinning house? Curious. House. Wow. We're going back to maybe nineteen. Wow. Yeah, I'm gonna let my age out the bag with this one. <laughs> we were like around nineteen eighty six, eighty seven, maybe. See. So you're around eight, nine years old. You're a DJ. I get it. <laughs> no, that no, no, not not that. No, no. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, right. Well, <laughs> Yeah, around, around that around age. Around that age, eight or nine years old, yeah. Something um, like that. I was actually, you know, before I got to the executioners, I was I was doing my thing and I actually met um, a guy named Dr. Butcher. One of my boys came to my house and he was like, yo, yo, man, you got to come to this guy, uh, Drew, Dr. Butcher's house, man. Like, I thought I was the best at that point. He was like, yo, got to meet this guy, man. He's doing so much stuff. So, you know me, I'm like, yeah, all right. Uh, ain't nobody beating me. So I ended up going over to this house. That's actually where I met Rob Swift. Big shouts to him. Mm -hmm. um, and when he got in the turntables, I just didn't want to get on anymore. Like th this was like at that time, he was doing so much incredible things, and I'm like, "Wow, man!" It just made me want to go back and practice, man. I, mm -hmm. I just remember that feeling of going back to practice. But he was like, "Yo, you can come over here anytime." Uh, you know, I got another guy that comes over to to to, to DJ with me. That he comes over, and his name is Rob. This is where I first actually met Rob Swift. Wow! And uh, you know, from there, I just kept going and. I wanted to get into the business. I, I wanted to do it. I wanted people to know that I was a good DJ as well, and I can do all these things. And of course, I had a resistance. A lot of people like, "Oh, this is a once in a lifetime thing." You know, too many people they don't make it. You know, and I just kept going. You know, I kept doing my thing. And Vic Padilla, who actually lived up the block from me, uh, had connections with the Beat Nuts, and he was doing their album. He was working on their album. He was all in the relativity. Uh, the Relativity Circle, which is the label. Mm -hmm. And I always remember, I used to do work with my man, scratch work, at Vic's house, because Vic had a studio in his house at that time. And he was like, he always used to tell me, like, yo, Sin, yo, your scratches, man, they're, they're really good, man. Mm -hmm. Like, I like the way they sound. And it started from that. And I was like, well, yo, can you put me on to something? Mm, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. is that possible? And he'd always be like, yeah, yeah, I, I'll do it, I'll do it. And this went on for like a year. And I used to always call him and be like, Vic, can you put me on to something? Like, I would love to scratch. I would love to do something. And he'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah. And it would never happen. So at this point, um, after I saw, like, I started watching DMC battles and seminar battles, and I started getting really inspired by watching guys like Aladdin, Miz, and all these other guys. And I'm like, yo, I'm like, yo, man, I, you know what? This is what I want to do. I want to join the DJ battle. Because I was seeing all the scratching and stuff. And I said, well, I just don't want to be known as a scratch DJ. I want people to know that I'm also can manipulate the turntables. And mm. I spent a lot of time with Rob practicing, watching him practice for the DMC and the seminar. I stood next to him. If you see the 92, I'm next to him. And I went, I was at Steve's house, Raider, all, I was around all of these guys, man. And, and all these things just motivated me to practice and practice hard to the point where I was like, well, I want to join the, the seminar. And this mm. is 93 when the seminar just opened uh, to the public. Like back then when you watch DMCs or seminars they weren't open to the public it's like you ha had to be a, a fan or a head to know about that but this uh, particular year they opened it up to the public where people of in the industry networks people can go there mm. and i remember joining um and i remember joining and just feeling like scared a little nervous because i i, I knew that i practiced a minute for it but all the people that were in it like rectangle and it yeah. was rectangle it was uh, uh, Toshi was in it. Heavy, uh, heavy, yeah. heavy heads. Big rollers. Very, very, very heavy heads. And for me, just going in was like, I'm just this new guy going in. Like, like, wow. Like, mm. and then I, you know, I, I'm like, and then I remember, uh, you know, people just telling me, saying, just relax, just be cool. Just wow. do what you practice. You know, do, do what you practice. Do, you know, you came this far. You've been practicing for six, seven months. So just do you. Don't worry about anybody else there. Don't, don't get a pressure by the crowd. And I remember Rob standing up there with me. I remember asking Rob to be, yo, Rob, can you stand up there with me? Like, because and Rob was like, yeah, man, bet. And mm -hmm. Rob actually came up and stood behind me, which made me feel comfortable. I had 
family uh, uh, behind me. And that's that awesome. Um, so I went through the rounds. Um, I wasn't as tight as I wanted to be, but I made my point. And my, my goal wasn't to win. It was just to go in and, and show the world and make a mark that I was here. And I remember A-Ball did this set, and I think he won, but I came in second, mm -hmm. which was my first seminar ever. And I came in second in that. And, and I made noise. Like, people uh, recognized me. They were like, yo, yo, this guy Sinister, he's really good. And that really would... would that meant the most to me. Rather than winning, I didn't care about a jacket. I just mm -hmm. cared about going in and letting people know that I can DJ and I wanted to show my love for it and appreciation and hope that other people appreciated what I did. And mm -hmm. I came in second. Then, after that, I started getting calls from Vic. And he started going, yo, I got some work for you. Wow. <laughs> I got some work. You want to come and do this and do that? I guess I had to show him that... I can do it on my own before he actually tried to give me any work. But then, or, then he started calling me for work. And um, I went in and my first scratch work ever, not ever, but on wax, so what gave my credit was, if anybody knows it out there, is the Beat Nuts album, it's the Street Level album. There's, there's two songs I did was uh, Are You Ready? And uh, what is that? Super Bad. Those are the two tracks that I did scratches on. And Iconic. Iconic album. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so I did those, and they gave me my credits on the album, which is uh, to let artists know, which is most important. All you artists out there, remember, credits go really far. Credits are what you need. So if you're doing work for anything, credits are what you need. That lets other people know and documents you that you're in the business, and this is your work. So people can say, who do them scratches? They can True look at the back of the album. So that got gave me a lot of credit work, and it got me close into – Relativity Records, which which with the Beach Nuts were on. So after I did that, um, I got another call from uh, Joe Fatal, which is, you guys know, was on Live at the Barbecue on Lost Professor's album. He was the first one. Uh, the second one, Fatal is Merciful, and they cursed me. So mm -hmm. he just got had gotten a deal with Atlantic Records, and Muggs had signed him. And at that time... Um, he was opening for, this is a big tour. It was House of Pain, Cypress Hills, Funk Dubious, and oh. um, The Hooligans, which is yeah. not Alchemist. And that was a big tour. This is when Cypress Hills was at, were at their peak. Early Alchemist as well. Like. Yes. Oh, yeah, man. Big shouts to the Alchemist. So Day. I got, I got, Raider actually passed that job on to me. Fatal asked Raider to do it. Rest in peace, Rock Raider. Rest in um, peace. Yes, he asked, uh, Raider to do it. Raider wasn't that type of DJ to go on tour with anybody. He didn't want to. So he was like, yo, well, he called me. He was like, Sin, they asked me to go on tour, but I don't want to do it. Uh, can you do it? And I was like, bet. So mm -hmm. I ended up going to Fatal's house and I ended up going on a month tour. This is straight out of the fucking seminar. This is straight out of the seminar. It had to be like three weeks later. So mm -hmm. I went on a month tour on a Cypress Hills tour with Cypress Hills, House of Pain, Funk dubious, and, and it went from like, I got exposed to like, they were doing concerts, dude. So it went from like 200 people to 80,000 people, like real quick. And and it was bought, it was like a real heavy transition for me. I was like, wow, I was really nervous, like, wow. But I got through it, and the month tour being there, I bumped into a lot of good people because you we went to a lot of different cities. I ended up bumping into the shortcut, the pickles, and just being in the business, I ended up learning how to network with people and networking. And that tour gave me a lot of uh, credibility because I was on it and I was networking. So when I got back mm -hmm. from the tour, um, I went back to do some scratches for Beat Nuts again on the remix. And that's where I met Common. <sighs> and Common was doing his album at the time. He just gotten off, uh, he just gotten the write up in the unsigned hype for Can I Borrow a Dollar? And yeah. he was starting to work on his new album, which is Resurrection. There you um, go. Yes. And, uh, Peter, who was the management of the Beat Nuts, ended up taking me on as a client. So as he took me on, I started to get into the relativity camp, which is because he was all into it. He knew all the booking agents. He knew all the all the uh, people in the label. So he was like, yo, this is my client. So he started getting me work inside of relativity. And that's when I met Common. So Common at that time was like, yo, we met. He was like, yo. Um, uh, I want you to do some scratches for my album because I heard what you did on the Beat Nuts album and I want you to do it for, for my album. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it. And it only started out as me just doing two cuts on the album. And I was like, okay. 
So we went to the studio. We ended up, he ended up booking time and I was in the studio and I thought I was going to go home. And he was like, nah, man, we, you know, we're going to be in here for a minute. So it's cool. So I was like, all right, you know, I, I was cool. Nice. And so in the studio, I did the two cuts. I did um, a song called This Is Me. And I did In My Own World. And those are the only two I was supposed to do. And then after that, while in the middle, I had bought the VHS tape of me in the DMC. And I was just playing it in the studio. And he was looking at it like, yo, that's you? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's me. He was like, I was like, I was just in the, the, the seminar in the DMC. And he was like, yo, man. That's dope. Like, I like that. You're really good. Like, Common always had that appreciation for what I did. Like, he was never that type of MC to be like, yo, I just play my music and just do this. Like, he was, he actually was into the, he was a fan. He was a fan of it. He's like, yo, this is actually dope, man, that you do that, man. Love that. And I was like, yeah. So it went from that and him saying that to, well, look, man, if you look, if, you know, these cuts sounded good. Do you want to do any more? I was like, yeah, I'm here. So let's go. So this is where it led to me doing um, all the cuts on that whole album. And uh, it just went from two cuts to that, which is a beautiful thing. And I sat, sat in the studio for a month. And the crazy thing about that real quick is that the, the, the one that everybody knows is Resurrection. And that actually was the last song that we did on the album. And that was the hardest song I can find cuts for. And I couldn't find anything for that song. And I, wow. I was like, yo. I said, yo, I'm just going to sit on it. And he was like, yo, just sit on it. Just get up in the morning. I remember going to get something to eat. I fell asleep in the studio. And I ended up putting on a nice and smooth record just to look. Mm. And, and um, that morning I woke up and I just had ended up browsing through songs on that album. And on that album was No Delaying, which has the resurrection cut. And I ran mm -hmm. right into it. It was just amazing. Um, it's like God was right there. And that right was the there. last cut. That's how that song came about, you know? So after we completed that album, uh, he said, yo, um, look, man, I'm being I see what you do. I'm looking for a tour DJ. And mm -hmm. I would love for you to be my tour DJ. And I was like, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I was like, damn right. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I was trying to be cool about it. Like, I knew I had it. I was like, yeah, I'll do that. But in my, yo, Inside, I was like, oh, man, this is fucking great. I'm fucking going on tour. I was just jumping up and down like a kid, yo. I was like, just feeling like just really elated inside. Yeah. Um. So that's how that happened. And then um, the Beat Nuts asked me to go with them. I started doing tours with the Beat Nuts, doing all that. At the same time, with my crew, the Executionist, uh, we were still uh, in. We were still uh, going around doing separate shows. And we started to get book heavy. Mm. And... We were moving around. We were already doing shows at Wetlands and all these old vinyl, all these old spots back in the days. We were already doing things on our own, which made wow. it good for us. So we got an album deal to uh, Asphodel, which is our first album. Everybody knows which is Expressions, Huge. which is um, our first album. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, we got that deal um, and we did good without no promotion. We did 90,000 copies. And and. It was wow. unprecedented for that time, yeah, for a DJ group of that caliber to 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 do that, make that type of noise, and mm -hmm. we did that, and we started we started getting really busy, and then all of a sudden, uh, Loud came to us with Sean C, who's also a member of us, was the A and R Loud, and he went to Steve Rifkin. Actually, we were at a show, we performed in L.A., and Steve Rifkin, the uh, the the owner of Loud happened to be there at that time. He saw us perform as a four-man uh, group, and he was like, yo, I want those guys. That's how mm. that came about. And then wow. Sean negotiated the deal for us, and we ended up going to Loud. So um, we ended up going on Loud, and we ended up touring ourselves. And in the meantime, I'm still touring with Common. I'm still doing stuff with the Beat Nuts on Solo. Then we started doing things, and it got to the point to where we – started going on the road on our own and we started doing things as the executioner. So uh, kind of dealing with an artist at that time was kind of difficult. So mm -hmm. I had to like back up from doing all that because I had been on the road, been been traveling with these guys for a long time, but I had to uh, make concentration for my group because we were going on as a band, as a four man. You can't do it without one uh, member. So this is how all this stuff came about. And then, you know, the rest is just history and just kept going from there. All the other stuff started coming. I hope I, hopefully I, uh, you know, rounded it off to where you can get an idea of where it started and where it, it, it went. Perfect briefing. And and one that totally and utterly 
is engaging. One thing I will say is um, your credentials as a DJ first, first and foremost. Um, I got I, I get the impression when you were on tour with Common, like you're saying, and also Funk Dubious and Cyprus, you were you were but unbeknownst to you, you were coming into contact with almost like, and correct me if I'm wrong, a whole other yeah. side of hip hop, which was the turntablist community at yes. large. Yes, absolutely. Do you, do you think your do you think your um your acclaim within the within the musical side of hip hop, like the 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 major label clientele that you were DJing for. Do you mm. think that added extra gravitas to what like became the components of executioners? Because when I think of executioners in a turntablist world, I I I I I sense a very more robust proposition. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I got you. I got you. Um that's a that's a great topic. Um do I think that the, the, with the caliber of artists I've dealt with had a lot to do with something, of course, definitely. I think anything of that caliber uh, adds to it and, and it, it uh, just sparks more creativity and more uh, more foundation in what you're doing. But mm. way before that, um, to answer your question, way before that, we had already built it on our own. Um, we, we came up battling each other. Uh, um, we were, were heavy heavy into it. We came up as just loving it and with the very important word for the DJs is passion. We came up mm. with passion and love to do this and we were just going back and forth with each other. We truly love this. I would go to Rob's house. Uh, I would go to his house, walk in the snow. If you ever hear Rob tell the story, I'll walk to the snow to his house just to watch him practice. Just a DJ with him, just to be around him. Um, he would, same thing. He would come to my house. We would go uptown, see Raider. We would all be together. We would go to DMC battles together. We would come to each other's house battled each other. This is actually how we ended up being good in battles. We battled each other. We we always kept our circle uh, tight knit. We kept wow. ourselves as insiders. We never we, we we never let outsiders into our circle. Um, as far as we practice or anything like. So it was kind of we were kind of introverted, and mm. we battled each other. That's all we knew, and we did it for fun. And this all led to us uh, doing shows at wetlands in the city. And getting little books and spot and sponsorships and gears gear gear, uh, gear sponsorships and people loving what we do. So we built that up ourselves. We built up the executions foundation by ourselves, and it all was built up through the love and the passion for what we did. So by the time by the time we got to these artists like Common and the Beat Nuts or Rob with Akinelli, uh, um, see, we were already like good. We were hungry. Mm. It was just another plateau another stage i guess that we were that we had to cross especially that we already crossed the stage of the love and the passion we were just doing it out of love i mean we were doing stuff for like 50 dollars back in the days like we were going to shows and just getting like 100 bucks mm -hmm. you know so we were doing it out of love uh for, we were already like a strong love and passion unit in ourselves before we met any of these artists but of course meeting these artists we were already conditioned to do things for them because and i guess they sensed that as well in us. That's why mm -hmm. we were, they wanted to get us because they knew these guys are already doing things on their own. They're out here joining battles. Uh, they're out here doing showcases with no MCs. They're just out here doing, people are booking them just to do DJ gigs and mm. spots, stuff like that, you know? Bye, sweetie. I'm just telling, I'm telling uh, my partner, bye. Sorry about that. Big up, big up. Oh, big up, big up. You said big up, Sapphire. Ah, you're oh, tight, you know? Sapphire inside the house. Come on. <laughs> for the price of one on this podcast, Killer Keller Podcast, come on. You want to show your face real quick? She'll show her face real quick. She's about to go. She'll, she'll show it. She's, what I'm she'll talking she'll about. Excellent DJ as well. You're gonna, you're doing? Yes. <laughs> you're going to catch her at Harold Day. She's also a B-girl. So she's an excellent DJ. Yo, all you girl DJs out there, she's, you're going to see her. Oh, she's oh, excellent. Oh, <laughs> I see. <laughs> See, the art form is strong so, in this piece. Love it. Yes, yes. It's 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 beautiful, man. It, it's it's great. It, it it stretches and you know, like look, I'm 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 chilling, I'm here, like like it's good. It's like there's things that like if I do like I can just sit here and, and watch her rock and it just inspires me. And when I get on, like there's things that she she helps me with. So it's kind of like it's like the, the whole vibe is just 
coming 360 and going like this. And this is what you kind of see in the posts that I'm doing. And like, mm. it's just kind of like that. And then, so yeah, that's, that's what it was, man. And, and the passion is, was always there. So I think those artists saw us for that type of uh, energy that we had. Mm. And it, it made a great difference in our careers, you know, as artists and DJs. <clears throat> sure. I want to stay on executions just for a second, but I also want to kind of um, move a little left from what you're talking about here. Um, yes. As a formation, four piece, band quote-unquote the executioners literally executed the music that they did on album mm. into the live arena using turntables from mm. the turntablist culture which you guys helped bring to the public eye the the the, the four of you now and the, and and of, of course there's the added aspect of hip-hop being in its purest form from New York City, you guys are, you know, uh, yes. you guys are so New York, it's uncanny. <laughs> but, but you know what it is? Each one of you had crazy personalities that I just, I, it reeks of playfulness. Like to, to, you know what I mean? Like it seems to me that you're going back to this place, this playful place mm-hmm. in your head. Yes, yes. Um, that's that's uh, a lot of people had asked that question. All of us have those characters. We. We all just take our uh, our human selves, and we just that comes out on the turntables. You you see that like Raider, for instance. Raider's more Raider. Rest in peace is more of Raider's a quiet guy, but very deadly. He's very like arrogant. Like he mm. he was always a very arrogant character, but very quiet, but always confident. Mm. So that came through as you saw when he DJed, and he was very you seen his facial expressions and. How he looked at the crowd, like he looked. Raider looked at the crowd, like you can't fuck with me. Yeah, fucking like, ninja. <laughs> yeah, he looked at it like he cannot fuck with me. Like we, anytime he looked up, and Rob is more of a a, a, a laid character, but smooth with his mm-hmm. stuff. So as you see with Rob, Rob will look up, but he's more of a smooth character and just kill you with his hands type shit. Mm. Uh, me, I'm the kind of guy that's like I'm like a joking, laughing guy, mm. but I can get serious at times, but I'm the guy that always have the fun on the turntables. You always see me having fun. I'm bouncing. Like my mouth is open. Um, I'm laughing. But then I'm, I'm, I'm also serious and confident and want you to know uh, that I'm really serious about what I'm doing. So I'll come serious sometimes and just have a confident look, but very playful and like a humble look because that's my character. So that mm-hmm. comes out. Um, Eclipse is like another humble guy and his character is a very mellow one. But when you see him, he's like really fast and he's mm-hmm. looking down, looking up. So... All he's like our, a charmer. He's a bit of a charmer, isn't he? He's yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. I guess that's <laughs> the best way to put it, you know? So we just take our human traits and we bring them out uh, mm-hmm. onto the turntables. And I think that's what separates us. Each one of us, you know, everybody has a different character. And that's what made us, uh, like, in that sense of people going, well, you, all, you guys all have different personalities and characters. It's just, all it basically is is different personalities coming out in what we do um, on the turntables and and, and, in our music. So that's basically what that is with us. Mm, Very interesting. Uh, The the closest common denominator that suddenly springs to mind, especially from a New York state of mind, is is the Ramones, you know, the the, the personalities within a band formation. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's it's, it's uncanny. And I love the fact that unlike other, um, I mean, I remember seeing Invisible Scratch Pickles in 97 do the Clams of Death, and that just absolutely wiped the floor of my whole yeah. <laughs> entirety. I was just like, I okay. Think we felt the same way, too. <laughs> yeah. we, we felt the same way, too, when we seen the, uh, the Scratch Pickles, when we first seen them. Um, we felt big shouts to Cubit, Mike, yeah. Apollo, all these guys. We felt the same way. Um, and, and I have a story about that. Like, before we even, when we were at Twilo and when we were battling, like, the, the X-Men versus the Scratch Pickles, we, I think both sides were really nervous. It was all fun, but we were both like, we didn't, no side knew what the other side was bringing. It was all in fun, but we were like. Did y'all really want to do it? Were you feeling like, do we, do we, do we? We, it was brought up by Alex Aquino and Crazy Legs. They're the ones that brought this up. They was like, yo, you know what? You guys should battle the fucking, uh, uh, the Invisible Scratch people. We were yeah. like, what? It's but an amazing that, it, battle. It's an amazing battle. Really, yes, is. man. It ended up. It ended up being historic, which is wow. And that's how that started. But we were like, wow, these guys. Can, I mean, we were still doing things on 
we had like two men, two men on one damn set. Like we were <laughs> like <laughs> these guys have got one dude doing the drum mm. on one set, and we yeah. were like two dudes. We were, we were like we were really novices then on that type of stuff. They kind of inspired us to do the team stuff, but we. The pickles are amazing. I think we, we had the same type of uh, reaction when we seen them too. Like it was just crazy. And then we mm. actually went to California and seen them. And we had our team routine, but they would they just blew it out the water, dude. Like they we all looked at each other like, wow. Right, let's nah. get into this because only a few people I can ever talk about this on a proper level. Talk to me about the clowns of death with me. Talk to me about how you felt about it. Because when that thing dropped, it was just like, yo, this is like four wheel mm-hmm. drive. Like you see one yeah. of the one with the drums, the other one with the bass line. That this sounds like the real thing. Yeah, it was it was it was crazy. It was amazing. I, when I first heard it, I just I was like, wow, like this is like actually like a fucking live band. Like this shit is really good. Like this mm-hmm. and this is turntable stuff. Like and these guys are like the, the masters at it. And I, it just was like it was amazing to hear it, man. Like mm-hmm. I really at first thought I was listening to a live band when I heard that. So yeah. I think that that album was really. That shit was really ahead of his time. Like mm. that's how I that's how I, I I envisioned it. I think we all envisioned the same thing, but that that was ahead of his time. I you think know, all of, I amazing. think all of you as DJs, and then let's let's take it back because I remember you know Rock Radio was it ninety three he won the World DMCs. Was it 93 he won it in ninety five. Ninety five. That's it. Yes. But before that was Rob's. Um, uh, uh, who was it for? Uh, Cutmaster Swift. Now. Cutmaster Swift. I know, I know, I know. You know, all these guys, Pogo, they, 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 they were all big uh, influences on you guys as well from the UK. Oh yes, you got Tony Vegas also, Prime Cuts, mm-hmm. those guys as well. <laughs> yeah, um, we had a lot of fun times in London. Actually, saying that, man, big shout out to Pogo and Swift because y'all know when we every time we came to London, we hooked up with Swift and Pogo. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like they were like family, and when they came out here. They the same thing. They came, they came to Raiders House, they came to us, we hung out with them. So it was like a family thing with them. And 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 it was it was great to be around them because they shared that same type of energy that we had. Mm-hmm. And they were from over there, the UK. And we every time we went over there, we just got into like DJ, uh like DJ sparring matches and cutting sets. And one one of the things I think I went to one of the stores one day. I think actually it was at Tony Vegas' store that Pogo was there. And it just was like a DJ expedition and everybody got on and everybody was just doing a scratching and stuff like that. And big up Billy Business as well with that question. Billy Business as well, DJ Business. Billy Billy Business, right. Wow. Wow, I forgot. Honestly, big shots. I forgot about Billy Business, but Billy Business was way, he was, he was, I think he was before Cut Master Swift, right? Yeah, he was was a B-boy first, man. Yeah, yeah. Legendary. Yeah. Wow, man, you just brought it back because that that's a name I haven't heard in a minute. But um, big shouts to Boogie Business. Wow. You, you're, you're like, uh, like jogging my memory about a lot of other stuff, too. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, man. Hey, listen, honestly, can we get into, because obviously in that time, Steve D, he was, a, he was an influence for you guys, particularly with the, uh, the sessions and the scratching, et cetera. Yes. Steve D. Yeah. Steve D is uh, the, put it this way. Everybody, everybody outside of the executioners, even the scratch world, has been inspired by Steve D. Mm-hmm. Um, Steve D was like the first guy, like to me, he was the first dude to take the way he juggled in, in these seminars. Was the was the first time I ever seen something like that, and I remember just watching Steve constantly on <clears throat> tapes and watching him until I finally got to meet him. And he's a very great person as well. Um, but he's influenced a lot of people. He's influenced me. I've recently uh, been to his house. Like, like I used to go to his crib when he lived in the Bronx. He's he's currently in Florida right now, but I used to go to his house when he was in the Bronx and go up there and just watch him and just vibe with him for hours. Crazy, and just talk, crazy. Talk to him about life and, and different things. Hmm. And just the influence of him alone, like Steve was a beast. So he influenced all of us. So me, myself, Rob, Sean, Raider, he influenced all of us. And he's influenced a lot of other people around the world. So... Steve is like that man. He's that dude. And he still influences me to this day. Mm. You know, I still, and, um, I, I just recently posted a video of me in his house uh, when he was DJing. That's one of the clips in the Bronx. So I still get influenced and inspired by watching him. Like his routines never get old to me. Um, I always learn new things every time I watch different parts of his routine. So 
an excellent person, an excellent influencer and, and inspirer, mm. just, just to say the least of that. These people we talk about now, I mean, as Mr. Sinister, you ca- you, you got to have a life to live a life, haven't you? And these people that come in, you, you don't, you never know, really know how much you absorb from them. But but when, Facts. you know what I mean? But when you Facts. see Sinister, like, do his <laughs> thing, mm. you, you come into your own, bro. Like, this is like some <laughs> other shit. Like, dude, like, it's crazy. Thank That's you. what the routine is, crazy. <laughs> Even to this Thank day, you. like. <laughs> Thank you very much, man. I Sometimes when I do it, I feel like, ah, oh, man, is this people going to think it's old and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, it's a blessing, man, because so many people still appreciate it, man. I just want to say I'm very thankful and grateful uh, that people still are appreciating uh, what I do in that routine and anything that I do. I'm appreciative mm-hmm. of it, man. And, and, you know, these days um, when I do the tricks, you guys see them. Um, usually I have to take a little Advil because, you know, I'm a little older and doing those tricks. I, I do them, but it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I ain't trying to hear that. You know, that's getting edited. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't trying to hear none of that. <laughs> man, I ain't trying to hear that shit. Like, you, just, you just do it good. But I'm very good, grateful. Man. I'm very grateful for that, man. I'm I'm really grateful that people are still appreciating what I'm doing um as an artist, man. And and, and it keeps inspiring me to, to do more. Um um so that's that's where I'm at now. I just mm-hmm. I just there's a whole bunch of stuff. I'm coming out with an album, um, and I just want to keep giving people as much as I can. Like I, I always tell my, my friends when they ask me, how are you going to do this, man? Like I, I, must, I told them I'm going to ride this bitch till the wheels fall off. Hell yeah. I'm not, do you think I'm that's not something, bro, do you think that is, when you sign up as an artist, you don't always get the, the long form agreement. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's no, like, you don't. No, not at all. <laughs> there's a lot of, the, yo, there's peaks and troughs and those troughs, whether it's, you know, personal or just i mean there must be a level of ptsd from coming off a tour like um like uh yes. uh a, 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 a funk dubious house of pain cybers you know there is isn't there yes oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah it's talk to me about that talk to me about the, the, the levels in which you you know respectfully you you go through these things and a lot of artists would, may not ever have experienced it well we've been oh man we like other than that touring is like it's fun at the same time, and it also is kind of stressful a little bit. You know, it's a balance out, you know, because you're with the same people every day for a fucking month, two months, however long you're going on. You're with the same people every day. Sometimes there can be differences. Uh, you're dealing with different people in different areas uh, mm-hmm. that you're going to, uh, you know. So, you know, then you're not eating properly. Sometimes you're not sleeping properly. Uh, but it's fun all in all. Um, I mean, I can, we've been on the execution days and myself, not even uh, mentioning the traveling that I've done on my own separate, but execution is we've been on like six U S tours, five European tours. Uh, wow. Not, not including the countries that we've been to separately, just getting booked yeah. regularly. So we're kind of like, I mean, I'm on my third passport and all of them, all of them basically are filled up. But, and, and, and so it's kind of like, you're dealing, I'm de- you're dealing with, we're, we're dealing with like years of traveling. Like my life was basically the road uh, since 23. I've known, I've known nothing but the road, being on the road, tours, buses, airplanes, different countries, different states, wow. uh, sleeping in different people's houses or uh, whatever. So it, it's kind of like a conditioning thing um, mm. it, 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 to where, you know, you have to condition yourself to eat a certain way or... Yeah. To not do certain things because me, uh, you know, at that at those points, still a little bit, but at that time when I was on tour, I was a wild boy. I was really wild. I'm a bad, bad boy. I was the one that always ventured off. And thank uh, God we never crossed paths yeah, on tour, bro. <laughs> yeah, get lost, get lost. They have to come find me yeah. sometimes. <laughs> uh, I'm always venturing out. They always show me what are you doing. I'm the one that's drinking. I'm the one that's out there doing. You no, know, just having fun and being out. So it's kind of like a. a a, a conditioning thing for for you for yourself if you're on tour that much. Yeah. Um, uh, eating conditions have to be regulated. Uh, you know, because you're out there, you're not eating too well. You get tired. You have to perform. You have to get up nights, whatever. So that and this, but all in all, man, I wouldn't take any of it back. You know, nah. I've have I've had I've had so much fun uh, uh, on the road. 
um, and so much fun and the experiences and, and, and the people I met and the places I've been. Um, I've had so much fun doing this and I wouldn't take any of it back, man. And mm. This is all in here that I keep it in. I try to release that in my music every time I do it, you know, so I keep the passion of what I'm doing and all of that comes out as I'm doing it. So wherever I've been, all the tours, the experiences I've been through, that all comes out in what I'm doing on these things right here. This is why these things, I always say that uh, music is emotion transmitted into sound, you know, because that's what it be, really is. It's it's people getting their emotions out. You know, even the artists back in the days, they made songs or when you see a DJ that really has a passion for it, you can really kind of see it and he, kind of, he or she kind of stands out like, wow, because they're releasing their inner feelings and it's bringing them out to a level where they can express themselves to whatever they're doing. Guitar players, turntables, drummers, yeah. singers, MCs. Once you tap into that energy inside of your body, you can actually learn how to release it to where it comes out. And it's it's healing and it's 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 pleasurable at the same time. That's, that's the best way if I made sense with that. Good, yeah. good. Yeah, no, it makes complete sense. Um, if you've got to override the initial feeling of what I'm do, what am I doing to I can just do it. And Facts. Yeah, you know I mean, and that's the freedom that you have to articulate whatever you want within the, you know, the the the, the, the um skill set that you you choose to funnel through, isn't it? Exactly. So you said it best. I should be interviewing you. you no, it should. Be, no, but <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, that's what I'm here to do, right? Like, I'm with you. And, and and the other thing, the other thing as well, is um, I think sometimes if you come back off a ride, like. Mm -hmm. Let's, for argument's sake, call it a a, a ten year vacation of of touring, yes. right? The yes. biggest hotel tour you're likely to ever go on, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you come off it, man. I, and this is speaking personally, so you're not saying I am. You, you uh, feel free to elaborate, yes. but I do feel like uh, it's hard to get up to speed with the real world because the real world would never have experienced the thing you had. So that leads oh. into a, a higher level of PTSD because you're just like, well, how oh. is anyone ever going to understand this? Oh yeah. That's, that's, that's actually a great touch up. And, and this is actually something that I go through daily. So right. what you said was right. Um, I always tell myself like something, I, people say, Oh, you're not normal. I don't want to be normal. I want to be a little bit off and crazy. That, and, uh, a lot, that enables you to look outside the box and break certain rules and, and create new things. So, you know, of course I'm seeing all these things I've, uh, you know, I was totally different from when I was like, I'm seeing all these things. And like now, because of all these things, my conversation, my, my level of conversation is much greater. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, 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 a more vast uh, choice of things or experiences to share that a person that, you know, quote unquote, hasn't been around where I've been, doesn't have. Mm -hmm. And also there's an understanding level that I have that a lot that certain people don't have, which is sometimes I clash with certain people that maybe don't understand me or understand uh, certain things that I've been through. And it's understandable. It's not saying that they're supposed to because everything is I've learned to understand that those people don't don't actually have that type of understanding. And sometimes as having a lot of understanding, sometimes you can, you know, you can like kind of like go crazy a little mm. bit sometimes. Like, oh shit, these motherfuckers ain't understanding me. Mm. This I've I've went ballistic at some point. I'm not afraid to say it. I'm I've went like loco sometimes. Like ah, yo, I'm just tired of this shit. Mm. Fucking out. I, I've done it on, on that mm. level where people couldn't understand me, but I had to learn. Like, well, they probably can't. Um, there was a story that that I had with Troy Hightower, who's actually the engineer, was the engineer of Commons albums, and he's actually a great engineer. Um. He was in the studio when I was doing Resurrection at, at the beginning stages, and he saw how I was at that point as a, as as just coming in, a gung-ho guy, wanting to work and just all playful and stuff, which I still am now, but he's seen that. So this is kind of like three years later after I toured the Common and I'd been on the road and I got my feet wet with the tours and mm -hmm. all that type of stuff, and I was in it. Uh, they told me that, I had a gig with Common. It was like, well, you're going to meet Troy, Troy Hightower at the airport. And I was like, wow, this is like three years later. I was like, I haven't seen Troy in a minute. Mm -hmm. So I met him at the airport. 
And I was like, yo, what's up, Troy? And just doing my regular stuff, talking to him. And saying, yo, I haven't seen him in the asking what's going on. And as I'm talking to him, he's just sitting there with a big smile on his face. like, <laughs> And I'm like, <laughs> it like threw me off. Like, like, And I'm like, yo, for like 10 minutes, I'm talking to him. And he's just smiling, not responding. I'm like, so eventually I'm like, yo, Troy, what? What's, yo, why are you smiling, man? Why are you smiling at me? Is something wrong? Am I saying? And he's just like, he said something really deep that, but that I just got, like, I, I, it took me like a minute to get it, but now I know it in clear. It's like, he said, no, man, it's, it's like, I just can see, like, the touring, like, whatever. Because I'd already been on, like, another two tours out there and been on the road, so I was a little more mm-hmm. seasoned. But he was like, I can see that the growth in you. Like, I can see, mm-hmm. like, you're like you're talking different now, and you're a little more seasoned. And more oh God, like, that's good. That shit see the growth. Yeah. You know? and, and and he just said he can see the growth in me, and and he saw it. He recognized it. So it's that shit is deep. That somebody mm. can see that in you, and it, it's crazy. So you know, it's kind of like that. And when I'm dealing with people like these days, I meet people that either uh, DJs, so to say. I mean, either DJs that are want to be in competition with me, which is not, which is cool, it's friendly competition, or they're intimidated by me. Like, I never find, I never have found, like, a grounded one in the middle that just wants to do music and not afraid of just doing themselves mm. uh, around me, uh, other than my counterparts, where, which, you know, we DJ around each other all the time, but, you know, that. And I always find that because, I guess, the understanding of things. I remember I brought my man to a club one time, and then, I asked him a DJ. He was a young kid, you know, mm. and, and I I don't think he understood the level of clubs where you can't play everything like and DJs don't do this. You can't blow all the hot stuff when when the one person's in the club. Like you gotta mm. like kind of stretch it out. So I told him, look, you can get on and just play certain things before, and then when the club starts picking up, like 12, 1 o'clock, that's when you start playing all the bangers. But he just was so hyped to get on mm. that he just burned all the hot stuff for like 10, 10 o'clock, 10 30, like three people were just walking in and he's just playing all the hot stuff. Like, playing anti like, up, just fucking going to the red. <laughs> yeah, he just just so it's <laughs> I know that he just wanted to get his shit off. He was that's what he was thinking. Like, yo, I'm just gonna get all my shit off right now. He wasn't thinking about no club playing. Yo, I gotta just but you know, and it's things that you have to learn as a DJ. Same thing with anything. So that was a good topic that you brought up. Yeah, and I, I still find that to this day. Um does it make your, does it, it does it make your circle tighter? Do, like do, you know what I mean? Do, the people that you hang around with, they'll ultimately know your the temperature. Like if you've got too much going on in your head, your CPU's hitting the roof anyway. Oh yeah, oh yes, uh, yes. I've I've. You don't want to meet new people. You, yeah. you don't meet a lot of new people. You want to try and yeah. keep your circle tight, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yes. I've hit the roof plenty of times. Um, I've done it, and, and it's no. It's no secret. I like talking candidly about it, like because it's part of my life, and, and mm-hmm. I've made videos about it. Um, I've done it plenty of times. I've, I've, I'm a very emotional guy. Like like I'm very adamant on respect, and I'm, I'm emotionally strong. Like I'm really, really, really. Honest. I'm the type of dude like where if I I'm a friend to you, I'm a friend to you. Where I, and if I feel violated, I'm a person that's going to tell you. I'm I'm going to come straight out and say it, even if it's at the wrong time, which is I've done it. Um, that's with, very New I'm York learning. as well, though. That's extremely yeah. New York. <laughs> yes, yes, man. It, it's it's it, and you got to be a beast in New York. Like it's kind of like people are moving around, things are moving fast, and you know, like even now, you know, I'm in Boston. This is like very quiet out here, and it mm. gives me time to think. It's peaceful. Like mm. when I get back to New York, I have to turn back into this other person. Like, like you know, because it's faster, and I'm like, you know. I remember going back, coming back from, uh, I think I was coming back from Seattle one time. And I remember just hearing a horn beep in New York. Which I'm, I'm a New Yorker. I remember mm-hmm. hearing a horn beep and I'm like, I just jumped. Like, I'm like, oh, wow, I got to get used to this shit again. Because it's just like, I was just in a quiet area for so long. It's like, now I got to get used to the horn blaring, the fucking screaming, mm-hmm. all that stuff. But um, what I've learned to do now is balance myself, which is, is good. Like, I've learned to understand... Uh, different types of emotions that trigger myself and whatever. So I'm able to release it, let it go and, and able to understand it for what it is. So it, it, it's calming me and doesn't, it doesn't, I'm not as uh, amp as I was before you know, or letting myself hit the roof. Like I used to easily. Cause then I can hit the roof so easily. It'd take somebody one second to make me do that. But now it's kind of like I'm calming down and I'm concentrating on what matters. 
<coughs> excuse me, <coughs> doing things that made me happy, mm-hmm. trying to stay out of a, uh, trying to be away from negative energy because that's always around. I try to stay away from that drama and negative energy. I try to keep myself from that <coughs> and keep my head in, in the, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Positive things like working. Usually what does it for me is the music. Um, that is like a great healer for me to do that, you know. So yeah. I, I've done it, you know, and I, I'm around I'm around a good person, you know. I'm around yeah. um, my homegirl, Sapphire. She is very positive. So, uh, and, and just to be around somebody that understands what you do yeah. and understands the level of, of what you've been through or what's going on, it's kind of like a relaxer. So this is where I'm at right now. And, like, I'm just, like, at a point to where I'm just now – and, and amazing as it may sound, at, even though all the stuff I've done at this age, I'm just starting to realize how to release my inner everything to come out and release it to 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 make it real productive, not just mm-hmm. doing it because I'm doing it, but to make it worth it. Because when my album comes, like I have never released a solo album. I've done scratches for artists, I've done scratches for major people, uh, I've done production for people, but I've never actually came out with my own album. And, all the years. Robbers came out, Rob's come out with yeah. six albums. We came out with two, which is the odd couple, if you guys know that, mm-hmm. um, which is mm-hmm. great working with Rob on that project. Um, now it's time for me to spread my wings in my solo. And I'm basically just taking it to a spot to where how albums used to be when mm-hmm. you look forward to getting albums, when people you hear in skits, people used to be in their cars either smoking weed or drinking, they want a good laugh or break from the music. Uh, I got skits on my album. Uh, uh, old, 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 and new sound and stuff. Mm. A lot of nice nostalgic MCs, keeping it that, keeping it uh, elevated, but still in that area to where it's feel good music, like how we used to listen to back in the days and what you went to the store to get. You know, because I remember mm-hmm. back in the days, you listen to albums. Now you listen to albums today. There's only like you can only pick out like two cuts on an album that you can hear these days. It, right. it, that's even if somebody's doing an album these days. Now motherfuckers is doing EPs. I'm doing six songs and that's it. Yeah, like yeah, back yeah, then yeah. you had, yeah, you had 12 songs for an album. And 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 sometimes you have bonus cuts, you know, and, and it made you it made you look forward to going to the store to buy these albums. This is what people went oh, to the store for, for and that's what the single was. Like the single was the introduction to the fucking album. It's like if yeah. you know, the single was banging, yo, I'm going to get the album. That's what Back in the days, that's what uh, that's what prompted Cash to go get the album because they were the yeah. single. Bro, I, you know? like Midnight Marauders. When that when the last song finished oh, on yeah. Midnight Marauders, I could quite happily have listened to a whole new album again. Yes, <laughs> so, that, was like a, that was a refresh. Yeah, it couldn't that have been. It needed to be longer. Like nowadays, right, right. You know what I'm saying, <laughs> <laughs> like you got another absolutely. sixteen for me. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, I agree. Mm. And and this is what I want my album to be. Uh, uh, this is where I'm gearing it on to be. I'm just releasing all my feelings on it uh, and, and keeping it. My whole thing is if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know, mm-hmm. so I, I always believe in keeping your sound because that's what people want to hear from you is you. They don't want to hear a modernized version of you trying to fit in with what's going on today. No, I'm not that dude. I'm the mm-hmm. dude that's going to I'm the dude that's going to give you me because that's that right. that is what people like to hear me for is what I do. And that's what's respected. So. That's what I'm trying to keep the energy on the album of doing what I do and keeping it in that genre where people know me for. And I'm not trying to be somebody I'm not because I can't be somebody I'm not. I can only be me. And that's mm-hmm. what's going to come out on my album. That's what comes out when I perform, <clears throat> when I DJ, when I do anything. It's the love and the passion and me doing what I do that comes out like that. So um, that's, what I'm, that's where I'm headed to. The journey to me I'm just like I'm 52 now, so the journey for me, I'm I, I'm at the halfway mark. I'm still happy I'm here, so I'm starting another chapter of my book right now, and this is this chapter is very good. So this is going to be whatever is here from now is going to be written in history again. I'm just trying to create a whole new set of history for myself. Mm. Peter Pan shit, man. This is that is timeless. It's ageless. You look ageless, man. It's 52. Don't give me that. Um, yes. And New York's good to you. You you're good in New York. New York's nice right now. Yes, yes. I'm 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 actually good in New York. I I'm in the Bronx in a good area. I'm actually close to Yonkers. Actually, I'm not I'm like right there. I'm good in New York. I honestly, to tell you the truth, I'm actually 
New York is kind of getting. I, I mean, I've been out. I've traveled all over. I've been out in New York. I've done everything there is to do in New York. I, I'm I'm New York. I'm a New Yorker, and I've sometimes I find myself getting sick of it. But uh, no, New York is where I'm from. It's always going to be in my heart. I'm always going to be here. But I'm at the point now where I need a little bit more of a uh, a laid back lifestyle. Respite. I would, you need rest. That's what I can say. It. So you know, I'm mostly coming out here. I'm usually traveling if I'm not in New York and I'm there. I'm usually. I'm usually coming out to Boston here. I'm usually out here a lot because, you know, it, I, it's very peaceful out here. I can actually sit down and think out here. Like, like, you know, you're dealing with, like, sleeping in, a, in an area where you're hitting horns and beefs and cats and gunshots mm. and all this shit, as opposed to an area where it's just nothing except the air conditioning. And you just can't hear anything. And it's just so fucking peaceful and quiet. Like, I can actually yeah. sleep good uh, here. That's no, mad, isn't it? I can sleep good any fucking way. Yeah, huh? Yeah, it's it's dope. It's it's good. I because can you can you can literally sleep in anywhere now. Once you've got the horns and like you say, all the, yeah. the city life, you know, mm-hmm. it makes it actually makes sleeping mm-hmm. in a normal place a little bit kind of. <laughs> hold on, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Uh, yeah, like it's weird. It's, it's it's it was weird. It's like where's the noise? Like mm. where the fuck? I mean, it's annoying. Like, where the fuck is the noise? Where's the car be going? It's like they're just laughing. Like, you're not going to get none of that out here. Man. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, we don't have that here. Not, not, it's, not, it's not as hard as in the city. So, yeah, that's that's where I'm at right now. I'm in, I'm in a good spot. I mean, I appreciate you guys even having me here on, on, the, on, on the station and, and, and letting me talk because, you know, I haven't done this in a minute. So it actually mm-hmm. feels great. You know, you see how my glasses on. I'm getting old. I can't really see too much, but. Good. Yo, you look exactly <laughs> how we left you, bro. You're looking well. You wouldn't be right, uh, especially you. on my show, not to have you. <laughs> a fucking legend right here. Um, I, I, I honestly cannot give you enough flowers because it's not just the past. We're talking, we're talking future tense here. And I hope when the album comes, you'll come and join us again and catch up and tell us what's going on. Oh yeah, I would love to. I would love to do that. Um, um, I would love to. Um, um, it'll be it'll be coming soon. I can actually, when we get off of here, I can actually. I have a turntable track called Rock Me, a turntable opera, and I can actually actually send it to you if you uh, you know, want to hear it and hear where I'm kind of going with the album. Yo, see, see, yeah, that's what happens when the presenter Doug Goody gets the exclusives. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I can't <laughs> wait. Anyway, kill it, kill it. I'm like, that much, please. Bye. <laughs> He's like, okay, bye. Bye. I see you later. <laughs> My guy. But thank I'm you grateful. So thank you very much. No, no problem. Thank, thank you, me. man. You smashed it. And there's going to be a lot of people out there that are very excited to know that you're happy, well, and building new music as we talk. That's huge. Yes. You see guy. this? This is this is where I'm at right now. I got. I'm right in front of the set. That's. Where I'm usually at, I'm here. I'm on it. I'm on. I'm on. I'm on the grind. This is what I'm doing. If I'm if I take a break to eat, I do it. I go and go chill out with my homegirl, or we go outside. But I am here. I'm on the grind. I'm not just just all the other DJs too to know that I'm here working. Like I'm in the lab when somebody's not doing something. Just like I hope when I'm not doing something, yes. somebody's doing something. This is, this is where I'm at. Yeah. So you know, this is what this is what you're going to get. I'm steadily focused on doing my album. And I don't even stop until I get tired. If I really can't, I don't force any ideas. If I get tired, I stop. And usually when I stop and I have that little rest and I get my second wind, I come back and this is where I'm at. So, you know, look forward to that. The album should be coming in, in it. I'm taking my time. It should, be, it should be coming like another month or so. I will be releasing a single. So I will be doing a single. So wow. just expect like more posts, more uh, new routines that I'm actually working on. I actually posted something last night. I'm, I'm trying to be on. I'm trying to just get on fire. I'm trying that to routine is fire. sick, so by the way. Routines. Yeah, yeah. The more of these routines, one thousand percent. Like it blew my mind. Like it was a bit of a talk because I just <laughs> I turned around to guys. I was like, "Yeah, he's on my podcast tomorrow night." They were like, "What?" I was like, "Yeah, hey, he's, he's on heat right now. He's doing it." <laughs> <laughs> thank Keep you. it going, brother. So Keep I'm, it going. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate that, man. And and yo, I love shouts to London, man. I haven't been there in a minute, man. Shouts to everybody over there, man. Like Pogo, Cutmaster Swift, uh, Tony Vegas, Prime Cuts. Prime Cuts is actually did something with, um, on Resurrection of Day. Tag me in. Big shouts to him. Thank you for the love, brother. Mm. Um, he hit me back. So big shouts to all spots in London, man. Because I've been London. We've been in London like around at least ten to 11, 12 times, man. London was like uh, a place that we always was at. We were constantly over there. So enough love to London. 
uh, and mm-hmm. you guys, man, because there's so many good DJs and artists over there, and I would really love to get back there at some point. So Bro. that's you know that's in the that's in the future, and that's in the uh, stars and where God's gonna take it. But I would love to be back over there. This is your bat sign, my brother. It's going out like a beacon. The London is waiting for you. You just uh, you you deliver, and we, we will uh, respond, brother. Thank you, thank you very much, my guy. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast. I like that. Big shout out to Mr. Sinister for joining. And uh, yeah, you know what it is. Sharing is caring. Tell a friend to tell a friend, all right? Crime don't pay, but neither did they, all right? Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't. You stay lucky now, people. Nice one, Sinister. Peace. Peace.